My guest on this week's episode of Susan Search is Daniel Russell, board member at GoFish Digital. Daniel is a veteran digital marketer. During his time at GoFish Digital, he's worked on campaigns for the New York Times, Wikipedia, General Electric, and many other iconic brands. He's an in-demand conference presenter. A few places you might have heard Daniel speak include Search Love, Content Marketing Conference, Inbound, and the Digital Summit Series. Oftentimes, digital marketing conversations and conference presentations fail to emphasize that you're going to need buy-in from the C-suite. The C-suite is less enamored with metrics we're accustomed to using. What they care about is profit. Daniel has served in a variety of leadership roles, including positions outside of search. This experience makes him a great person to talk to about stakeholder buy-in. We'll have a wide-ranging conversation about how marketers can speak more persuasively to key stakeholders, and just as importantly, what not to do. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with Daniel Russell. We'll chat about the importance of speaking about profits, not just vanity metrics. We'll spend a little time talking about the messy world of attribution, and I'm going to ask him about the importance of forecasts and predictions. All right, Daniel Russell, welcome to Sudden Search. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. So I I watched your talk at Search Love. It was about getting executive buy-in. I love this topic. I think it's super important. Um, even if we know a ton about SEO, if none of our changes get implemented, what good was having that knowledge? So let's start here. Um, you have a, a story about CRR. What hmm. does CRR stand for? And what might that have to do with getting buy-in from the C-suite? Yeah, yeah. So CRR um, was an acronym that I heard in a client meeting about a decade ago. <laughs> and uh, we we went into that client meeting. It was an end of year presentation. So we were summarizing everything that had happened throughout the year. Um, we, we went into that meeting feeling pretty good because uh, in terms of pr pretty much all SEO metrics, we were doing really well. Rankings were up, organic traffic was up. Leads from organic was up. Um, we were even able to, to track a decent amount of revenue coming from organic as well. And so um, overall, I, I'd still, even by today's, you know, my, my more mature standards, uh, you know, a decade later, I'd still gauge it as being uh, in, a, in a good spot in an effective place. However, um, the VP of marketing who is sitting right next to me, she uh, started asking some some more you know pointed questions uh, like, how does this compare to the leads that we were bringing in from this one initiative last year? And I had to say, oh, I I don't know, I don't know much about that initiative. And then she said, and and what's what's been the CRR on SEO for this year? And and I had no clue what it meant. <laughs> and so I I had to say, we'll we'll have to look into that with the plan on looking it up on the internet later. <laughs> Um, yeah. but CRR is the cost of revenue ratio. So, uh, basically what you're doing is you're, you're taking the cost that it took to acquire that revenue over the actual dollar amount of that revenue. And so your goal obviously is to have revenue far outnumber the cost it took to get there. Um, you want that, you want that ratio to be as minuscule as possible, right? You want the cost relative to the revenue to be as low as possible. And um, it, the reason why it was a good eye opener for me is because one, it <clears throat> helped me see that I needed to familiarize myself with some non-marketing, non-SEO yeah. uh, jargon, right? But then also, especially, I needed to uh, make sure that everything I was doing was tied back as closely as possible to the dollar effectiveness of what we were doing, because that's what the C-suite cared about. Yeah, I, I love that, and I, I think there's one thing. I, if there's one thing I really liked about it, it's you're taking a responsibility a lot. So you're you're saying, you know, like if they don't understand what we're talking about, that's our fault. Or if they do understand what we're talking about and they just don't care, that's our fault. So you're not passing this this hot potato. Um, and, and in either scenario, you're, you're taking accountability. So I hear a lot of SEOs point out that they're introverts, right? Or they can be mm -hmm. defensive. I'm telling them the correct things. Why should people really take that, that responsibility? Why, why is that so important to really see, see this as like, it's not just about, you know, technical SEO and all that stuff. It's about taking responsibility for really communicating uh, and making sure that people are understanding you. Yeah, I think, 
I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, one of the traps that anybody can fall into, not just SEOs, but that you know, anybody in any position can fall into is thinking that what you do is in a silo or in a bubble, yeah. you know? So yeah. thinking that, that I, I, all I have to take care of is my little bubble. And if I'm doing that, it doesn't matter who understands outside of my bubble, what I'm working on, I, I'm doing a good job. And uh, the, the truth is that, you know, communication is still important and uh, it's very unlikely unless you are, you know, a solopreneur with just your website, it's very unlikely that what you do is, is fully in a silo or in a bubble. Instead, it needs to connect to a greater purpose, a greater goal. And for most companies, and I, I think this is where sometimes I, I hear a lot of SEOs get tripped up too, which is, you don't necessarily want to feel like a cog in the profit machine. Does that make sense? Right. You know, like you, right. yeah, you, you don't want to feel like you're just working for the man. But, um, but the truth is that we are, you know, that's, that's why yeah. SEO exists. Um, I think I, I've given a talk before about Google's motivations even. And I think I, I've seen Googlers, you know, uh, misappropriate their role in their, their day-to-day to something that's not accurate either. Uh, because what Google, Google will talk about how their goal is to make all information in the world findable, right? That, right. that they have all these other uh, really good intentions for, for the world and for humanity. And I don't doubt that some of those intentions are there, but the truth is that Google's here to make money, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and, and our employers are too. And so there, there's that relationship that I think we sometimes forget. And when we forget about it, it actually comes back to bite us. And uh, so if we, if we think that we can just worry about, you know, making our, our, our client or our, our employer's website faster and, and ranking higher and more effective, but not worry about the money side of it, unfortunately, it's just, it's just a little, you know, naive, nearsighted. And so I, I think giving the attention to communicate what you're doing in non-SEO terms to the outside world, outside of your bubble, is very worthwhile. I like it. And the, the other thing you do really well is that you're able to have empathy for the CEO. So you know, we, up to this point, we talked about executive buy-in. To be more specific, we're talking about the CEO. And we're talking about um, the, the person at the top of the food chain. So as, as an SEO, you know, one of the things I've realized about this job is you might meet with any number of stakeholders on any number of engagement. You meet with the marketing director on this one, you meet with the VP of sales on this one, but you get the the CEO, I, I think. And I, I think it'd be worth talking about it for just a minute. What's going on in their brain that might be different than the other stakeholders that CEOs are used to? What, what, how are they thinking in ways that are different from like a VP of, of marketing or something like that? Yeah. The, uh, so w one thing I think unique to a CEO, I, and I think a lot of other stakeholders uh, and department leads and heads will have this viewpoint too, but in terms of it being unique to the CEO, I think the CEO has to think this way or else they'll get fired, <laughs> basically, which is they think in terms of profit and loss, and that's, that's where everything comes down to. Um, you know, obviously, uh, one of the big financial reports that a CEO gets regularly uh, is a PL, a profit and loss statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's how they're perceiving the company. In fact, a lot of CEOs I know, and then even in terms of uh, myself and my partners leading Go Fish Digital, um, that, that PL statement is is you know one of the most important documents in terms mm -hmm. of the business. And so uh, th that is I think a big key to understanding how the CEO is approaching things is PNL, and um, you know, it, and as an example, I uh, in fact I use this example in my talk as well. We we had a client where we were able to report to the CEO. It was in the pharmaceutical space. Um, he was a long-term pharmaceutical executive who had split off to start his own startup. Uh, they had significant funding. Um, they were in a really good position to take advantage of everything that was going on with COVID in terms of actually having a product that could help. And so a lot of good things were coming together for them. Um, and, 
you know, it, it was one of those things where they, they saw the opportunity and they knew that their web presence was going to be a big, important part of that. So we got brought in and in theory, it would have been just a really great SEO client relationship setup. Um, the, the problem that we ran into was he, the CEO, thought that he knew enough about SEO to tell us exactly where to focus. And uh, where he told us to focus was to send traffic to the moon. Other CEOs that maybe are a little bit less familiar with SEO, they might not necessarily know to say, you know, I want keyword rankings up this amount and I want traffic up this amount compared to last year. Um, instead, they might just say, hey, I want to see this amount of money out of SEO. And honestly, that would be better, in my opinion. It, yeah. That would be a, a better directive from an a CEO. But instead, he told us, hey, I'm very, very familiar with SEO. I want traffic to the moon. I want rankings up. Here's the keyword set. Like, let's get at it. And we said, great. And, we, and almost immediately looking at the keyword set, we found a lot of pages uh, within their existing blog content that was on the cusp of page one. We saw a lot that were close to getting in the top three rankings. And we thought, all right, here, here's a lot of stuff we can move the needle on fast. And it honestly didn't take long. It only took uh, you know, about two, three, four months before we started seeing some major jumps in organic. Mm -hmm. And to the point where uh, one of the reports that we sent over to them, uh, I think it was like our fifth month working with them. Uh, the year over year for that month, I think it was like April, but April of that year compared to April of the previous year, organic was up 1,100 something oh, percent. Amazing. And yeah, so it, if I was just... Yeah, case study stuff. And if I was just in my little SEO bubble, um, which unfortunately, you know, his directive was as well, I would have thought we are destroying it. We are killing it. And, mm -hmm. and that is only thinking about the SEO itself. The problem was, is that SEO needs to be connected back to the business case and the bottom line and the profit. Mm -hmm. And I, because he said like, I know SEO, this is what we need to do. I was taking him for his word and thinking, yeah, that is that, all right. He knows what we need to do. That's all we need to do. And I, I wasn't doing my own due diligence of how this was impacting the bottom line. And then I got a message from him not too long after sending over that report that saying, you know, basically, Daniel, hey, we need a pause. You know, this is some impressive stuff, but we need a pause. The board is putting some pressure on me to, to drive revenue from this. And he never told us about the revenue part. But we yeah. needed to have implied that. And, yeah. and so that, that was one of those cases where I was not thinking in terms of profit and loss. Um, I was purely thinking of traffic. And that traffic, while great, maybe very like top of level exposure value stuff, you know, maybe the value is there, but it wasn't converting traffic. And uh, it, it was in terms of converting to dollars. And so that, that was ultimately uh, the reason for our pause. To his credit, they came back. Uh, they came back, I think, five six months later, uh, and reengaged with us. And and you know, we had. Now we knew now, and and I started calling it the Trojan horse of SEO because because he said, "Hey, we, we want rankings," but really, what he wanted was money. Like that that was what was hidden inside the horse. And so for that that next round of engagement, I knew like, all right, time to focus on on actually driving profit. But that first time was a surprise. I love that. And you, you call that the trap. Like you know, there's, there's these traps. I'll tell you things, but, but avoid it. I, I like that a lot. So, you know, one of the things that, that you drive home in the speech is that, you know, we have to have these conversations about profit and about money. Um, so, so here's where we get into that messy world of attribution. Um, so like in simple terms, yes, showing profit would be by far the best way to speak to a CEO. Real life, sometimes it's hard to tell who should get the credit and why, and there can be these little turf battles between SEO and PPC or CRO, and it's like a pox on all our houses. Uh, <laughs> I want to have these financial conversations with the CEO. What, what tips do you have about making sure we avoid some of those potential landmines that we're not that, that, that we're doing this intelligently and that these are non-controversial kinds of uh, numbers that we're looking at? Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think... Um... I definitely think that that perfect attribution is almost always a mirage, right? Like it, it's yeah. not can't can't ever quite reach it. Um, I do think that there's a lot of steps that we can do to better better ourselves in, in the space. And um, unfortunately, what it 
what it relies on is us just taking full responsibility to get exactly everything we need. And I think sometimes when uh, we start with a client or we start a new project with a, with a, um, with our employer, we, we just expect that they will be able to give us what we need, right? Like, uh, you know, they, they hired me to be on their SEO team or they hired us to be their agency. Clearly they, you know, they're, they're giving me money or giving us money. They, they are going to be invested in it and give us what we need to succeed. And, um, very often, even just from an SEO standpoint, that's not the case, but definitely from an attribution reporting standpoint, that's often not the case. And so I, I think uh, uh, an important key when you kick off any project like that is a, an audit of any analytic setup. I'm blown away at how often um, very robust marketing initiatives and companies have analytics set up and then it's misfiring somehow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's miscounting conversions or not counting any conversions. And you know, there, there's just all sorts of problems that could arise. So an audit of the analytics setup, making sure that that's set up properly. And then the other is uh, really digging deep on the business or client end to ask, how are you tracking leads? How are you tracking conversions? How are you tracking the money that's coming through? And more often than not, the answer to those questions is some sort of CRM. Uh, you know, it's like a Salesforce. It's something right. like that that they're using. And so after auditing analytics, I want to get full access to their CRM. And uh, larger, larger companies, especially enterprise level, they, you know, they, they'll have silos for that. They won't always allow you to have all access. And if that's not possible, then I need direct access to the person that has all access. <laughs> you know, like if you're not going to give us all access, right. I need the person that has all access and they need to be willing to, you know, pull reports for me when, when I need them. Yeah. And so that uh, doing doing those two big things right at the start, it requires setting expectations saying, you know, hey, at the start here, it's going to be laying the groundwork to make sure we we actually understand what's happening but it will pay dividends long into the future. Um, and, and so setting that expectation can be important, but, but yeah, analytics audit, CRM access, uh, go a long way. Well, I like this. Uh, and it, it, it goes to the next point, which is, you know, CEOs like forecasts. They like predictions. You know, this, this phrase that we're so fond of in, in SEO, you know, it depends. That doesn't fly with, with CEOs. They want you to make a call. So mm-hmm. it's hard. Every, people listening to this, I'm sure, are going to go. SEO is volatile. It's it's subject to change all the time. For market forces, market forces are at work that are totally out of our control. Um, you recommend you have a lot of good recommendations. One of them is like a forward looking statement. Um, other ways of, of, of just like settling down and going. CEOs get that there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Uh, just live in that world with them. What advice do you have? I, I thought that was a really important part of the talk was about forecast, predictive, uh, pr- predicting things into the future and getting this to, to speak the love language of CEOs, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the forward-looking statement is a term of art that is used in a lot of earnings calls and, and financial forecasts. And um, j- just any time a, a company is, is speaking to people outside of the business, they'll often use that term. And the reason they, they like that term is because it helps uh, give context to the, the claims they're making, right? So they're saying, we're going to make a million dollars next year. But this is a forward-looking statement. And it's based off of, you know, how the, the current circumstances, the, the risks that we already outlined to you, if things change, we'll update that statement. And I think it's something that we as marketers should borrow uh, and start implementing in the way that, that we report. And, um, you know, say at the beginning of the year, we, we're kicking off with with uh, the, the initiative or with the team, we we should give a forward-looking statement and say, hey, this is based off of what, what we see right now, this is where we think we'll be. And this is a forward-looking statement, things may change, and when they do, we'll update it. And I think that's a big part too that sometimes right. marketers are nervous about, which is, once I say this, I am bound. I'm bound to this forever. And I will say, I, I personally have worked with some leaders that do feel like they can bind you to it forever. Um, one, one thing that has helped, even in those cases, though, is to, to use that same lingo in terms of this is, 
the, looking at things right now, this is what we predict. This is what we project. But things may change, and when they do, we'll give you an updated forecast. And so um, what that does is it helps set their expectation that you know the, the projection you gave them may change. And then the onus then falls back onto you to make sure that you're paying attention to the situation and providing an updated forecast. Because sometimes I think people forget that they never told people that things have changed. Hey, this new up, this algorithm update just rolled out and it's totally changed everything. But then they don't really tell them until it's time to report. <laughs> and then, right. and then they say, well, but you told me it was going to be different. We said, well, but this update just happened. So instead of waiting to, for, for when it's time to report, to take that ownership over your projection and update it when, when things change and say, sometimes you get to update it for the better too. Sometimes you get to say, Hey, I know I said we'd be at this spot, but guess what? We're 10% further. And, and this is why, and I've given you an updated projection because of that. Um, and the, the final thing I'd say is that there's always this temptation to, um, to kind of spin negative things and then take credit for positive things, right? There's always that temptation. Um, good executives will be able to tell. And um, most of them that I know appreciate when you shoot straight and, ex but, but they, they don't appreciate when you, when you, the difference between shooting straight and giving an excuse, they don't appreciate excuses is, right. An excuse is just saying we didn't hit it, and this is why. Um, shooting straight is saying we didn't hit it, this is why, and this is how we're adjusting, right? It's yeah. it's just that one additional step that makes it no longer an excuse. Instead, I've identified the issue, and here's the solution. I've already thought about it. Here's the solution. Updated forecast, um, and that that goes a long way, and and makes it from something they don't like into something that they tolerate. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a really good, it's a really good point. Um, along the same lines. So you've got to give, you talk about, you're going to have to give some bad news eventually. Sometimes you're going to have to say no, right? Like sometimes the expectation, it gets out of whack or um, you, you I, I was really interested. I want to kind of unpack that, you know, getting into traps where you could have a misalignment, you know, some, some months down the road between the original expectations and what, what's been delivered. I, I wonder how do you tell a, a CEO who's like controlling all your all your paycheck? Okay, I understand that you want to rank number one for the term money. You're not going to, uh, you know, like <laughs> no. Uh, how, how do you have these candid conversations with CEOs who are used to getting their way? Frankly, yeah, I think th there's there's certainly some leaders out there that can't be reasoned with and. Mm -hmm. um, in those cases, there's there's not there you know there's honestly nothing that can be done. It's going to unfortunately probably go awry one way or the other. For for most of the others, and I think it's a good majority, luckily, um, I I I have found that being speaking from a, a place of of authority and experience is a big key, and the 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 wise and the authoritative. Don't won't ever say yes to everything because they know they know they know better, right? Because they they are wise, <laughs> and so oftentimes a, a an indicator that someone knows what they're talking about is that they will draw the limit. They'll draw the line and say that is off limits, and here's why. And I think the here's why is the big key, um, and and that's what that's what helps you you know differentiate between just not wanting to do it versus knowing you can't because you're wise, you know, you've got that experience. Oh, yeah. um, and so say, saying no, I've, I, in my experience, telling somebody something's not possible and explaining why often raises my stock with them. They think, oh, oh yeah. Daniel knows what he's talking about. You know, not, <laughs> he, he's bold. He was willing to tell me no. And clearly he's knowledgeable. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it came because, and it came because I understand, I, I told him, Hey, I understand why that's an attractive goal. Uh, it's not possible. And here's why, what I would recommend instead is X, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, it, it basically saying no, explaining why, and then giving an alternative recommendation, um, is, is the best route to go. I've found to say no. Well, wonderful. And this is a, 
This is the last uh, last question from the talk. Is it feels to me like there's a psychology switch that needs to go on sometimes. So you're really changing the, the mindset of an SEO from being a person who does SEO. So we'll, we'll talk about the report. We'll talk about what the metrics are doing to really being more of a business advisor. And, and a business advisor uh, helps you with things that maybe aren't even about SEO. They, they maybe don't help the company, but you're just, uh, you're, you're looking out because you're involved in profit conversations. You're involved in finance conversations. Uh, you've, you've earned their trust because you don't always like try, try and nickel and dime here and there. Um, you're not trying to confuse or obfuscate in the way that you speak to them. Uh, it, it's about leveling up from just being in this SEO or even marketing silo to being at, at, at a seat where you're a trusted business advisor. It, it, does that sound like I, I've summed up your position or is, is there more to more to unpack there? Yeah, I, I think uh, SEO as an industry has often felt relegated as kind of like this side uh, show type of thing where it's like, all right, right. you know, uh, traditional advertising, paid search, that's, that's more of what we consider marketing. SEO is kind of this little side thing. Luckily, I think that's changed um, over the years and, and the pandemic definitely pushed that along as well because people had to shut down their stores and rely on their websites more than ever. Um, but part of it, part of the reason why I think that's been the case is because of our, uh, proclivity to not think about profit and not think about ourselves as business advisors. And, and so if we really want a seat at the big kids table, if we want to be taken more seriously with the other branches of marketing, the other branches of business, uh, yeah, I think, I think that, um, we need to start reforming and, and rethinking about what we do from just rankings and website updates and more of driving the business forward. And if we, if we can reshape our thinking in, in that way, then we'll talk more like, you know, we're thinking about the business as a whole and not just SEO, and we'll report more on it. Um, and honestly, one of the things that uh, I've mentioned before is that sometimes focusing on profit feels like a cop-out, you know, or, or it feels like we're not being true to to SEO, or again, back to what we were talking about before, it feels like you're just working for the man. But the truth is that a, a profit focus actually improves SEO results. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it actually makes us better SEOs. And so uh, definitely, I think treating it, treating ourselves as business advisors um, will definitely elevate us and elevate SEO generally in, in the business landscape. What an important point. It's not, it's, it's just, it will improve the SEO too. That's the, that's the other side. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, well, listen, Daniel, I've had your, your teammate, Chris Long on the podcast, Go Fish mm -hmm. Digital is winning some insane amount of awards and everything like that. What, if people want to learn more about you, want to learn more about Go Fish Digital, I know there's a newsletter we can link to. What's the best, uh, best way to stay in touch with you guys? What's your favorite social media? Those sorts of details. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, you mentioned Chris. A lot of people know about Chris Long. Um, the newsletter that he, that he runs uh, as part of Go Fish is called The Splash. Definitely recommend subscribing to that. He uh, he summarizes all the biggest you know news pieces from the past week, and then adds in some of the research that we're doing at, at the agency as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, definitely happy to connect with anybody on. LinkedIn, uh, you know, pretty easy to find Daniel Russell, go fish. And then Twitter as well. My handle there is DNL Russell. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, I, I've really enjoyed it. I like this conversation a lot. It is a nice, uh, selfishly, I do this every single week and it was a nice break from chat GBT and. GBT yeah. So, yeah, I believe that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, so I appreciate, I appreciate the rest of it, but I, it, I think this is, this is the job. I, I hate to say it. Like, as, as much as we talk at, at conference speeches and on blogs about a lot of tactical stuff, this is where the rubber meets the road for, for me and my career. So I thought it was really a, a, an impressive talk and an important topic. So uh, thanks for coming on and, and exposing it to our audience. Yeah. Yeah. Glad you liked it. And I, I will say, um, I, I, you know, I, you can't, you can't judge everything off of, you know, compliments and what people say after a talk, but 
I will say that of most of the talks I've given, this one seemed to really hit home with the executives that were present in the audience. There was a couple um, CEOs and, and COOs of uh, companies, especially tech focused companies in the audience. And they came up to me afterwards and said, you're speaking our language, man, this is good stuff. <laughs> you know, they, they said, please keep at it, keep preaching that. Um, and so it's, it's something that they clearly want us to pay attention to. So. Well, awesome. Well, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. I'm going to give you a virtual cheers for everyone else. Cheers. I will be back next week with another episode of Sudden Search. Thanks a lot, Daniel. My pleasure. Thanks, Mark.